Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gein, and today we're talking about landlord tenancy law in Canada and some of the unique challenges that are being faced by some Canadians. This is an area of law that has a direct impact on millions of people, whether they rent their homes or a commercial space or rent out a property that they own. It's important to have an understanding of your rights as both a landlord and as a tenant. We're going to be chatting today about both residential and commercial tenancy cases and some unique disputes that the courts have seen recently. We're also going to be discussing how COVID has impacted this area of law. We're joined by two experts in the area of tenancy law, my friends Karima Saad and Daniel Waldman. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Uh, Karima, let's start with you. There's some news in Ontario. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people have been put in tough positions, and it was especially bad at the beginning when businesses were shut down and people couldn't work. So the provincial government took some action to help tenants by imposing a rent freeze, but that's gonna be ending on December 31st. What can you tell me about the rent freeze and what's coming next? The rent freeze applied um, pretty much across the board to tenancies that are covered under the Residential Tenancies Act, um, but it didn't actually prevent landlords from attempting above guideline increases. Um, so it was sort of a partial measure. And what we can expect going into 2022, um, and, and in fact, some landlords have already started serving these notices of rent increase because it, it takes three months before it comes into effect. Um, the, the, it, 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 we are going back to normal um, where landlords are entitled to, to raise rent pursuant to the provincial guidelines. So what exactly are those guidelines? You can raise rent, but it's, it's regulated about how much you can raise it by. That's right. There is a percentage maximum increase. And if a landlord wants to go above and beyond that, um, they need to apply through the landlord and tenant board for an above guideline increase. So there is a special process that ensues. Um, and, and again, this applies. Um, the Ford government prior to the pandemic changed the rules um, so that rent control is no longer uh, applicable to every unit. So depending on when a unit was constructed, um, you know, they, they aren't subject to a guideline increase. Um, the landlord can pick a number at their discretion. And that would be by, by when it was constructed, it tends to apply um, to older buildings or to newer buildings or, or which buildings does it apply to? To newer builds. Um, the idea is that it would prompt more development. Uh, whether that's actually borne out is uh, a subject for another day. So Dan, your comments on the Ontario rent freeze and what you think it means for landlords and tenants, you know, what should people expect and, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, to echo what, what Karima said, yeah, it's true. I mean, you're hearing a lot in the news now that uh, tenants are getting a lot of notices because landlords can't wait to to get this in place because it's been frozen for a while. And a lot of the time, I mean, the rents could still only be raised by negligible amounts, but it's important, I think, not to downplay it because a lot of tenants who have been faced with adversity over the past year uh, could barely make rent as it is. So, you know, their, their rent are going up and their incomes are not keeping up with these rent increases. So it's something that the tenants are, are having difficulty with. At the same time, landlords, especially in large developments, have been stating, and again, this may be a discussion for another day, like Karima said, that they're facing increased operating costs over the past year, increased taxes and utility costs. So they're saying that they rely on these rent increase to keep pace with the expenses that, that they're facing. So you know, there's talk about how it's putting pressure on, on both sides as well. Dan, just a quick, quick, very quickly, your opinion on rent, rent control as a policy. How has it played out in, in other jurisdictions? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's uh, in other jurisdictions where, where they don't have it. I know this has been causing problems. I mean, there were a lot of stories coming out of New Brunswick, say, over the past year where they didn't have rent controls and landlords were able to increase rents if uh, they give 90 days notice and there were these bizarre stories about landlords butting heads with tenants over 
issues that had nothing to do with their tenancies. And then tenants getting notices saying the rent's going up by 300%. We've got to head to commercial break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you both about some of the commercial tenancy impacts, especially that we've seen during the pandemic. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing landlord and tenancy law with lawyers Karima Saad and Daniel Waldman. Now, Dan, COVID obviously made life difficult for commercial tenants. Uh, lockdowns have made it hard for businesses to meet their obligations, including rent, since they weren't even able to operate a business for many months. So there have been mm -hmm. tenants who, who sought relief from the courts and from, from they sought relief from their lease obligations. And you've written about mm -hmm. one especially interesting case from British Columbia, uh, Cherry Lane Shopping Centre in Hudson's Bay, where mm -hmm. the Bay had failed to pay their landlord. So what can you tell me about that case, what the, what the Bay was saying, what their landlord was saying, and what the court ultimately decided? Yeah, so, I mean, th that is true. Commercial tenants have had a very rough go at it since COVID started. And in my practice, what I see is they're the class of client that I deal with who are suffering the most through this thing and have been because lockdowns and other measures, they can't operate their businesses. The first thing that comes due is rent. And what they're arguing, and this is true, is these are circumstances outside of our control. I mean, it's not our fault. There's a pandemic. We can't even open for business you got to help us. There's something you have to do for us. And unfortunately for them, uh, courts have not favored them because there's nothing in their leases that says they could get out of paying rent. And that's become a problem. And in this case, uh, an interesting argument was raised on the COVID side that the Bay was saying that we operate in a shopping center and the landlord has a positive obligation to operate it in a first-class manner, to market more aggressively during the pandemic, to take measures to make sure uh, health measures are instituted to help drive business because we're renting in your space, you have that obligation. So, it, and because of that, they're saying, because you're not doing that, we should be relieved from paying rent until you start pulling your weight as well. So, they brought that to the attention of the court over there and you know the judge not unpredictably said well this is not really an issue when it comes to the payment of rent that even if this is true it doesn't excuse you it doesn't get you out of paying rent so tenants hands were tied and um and and this is just one of many arguments that have been raised in this case and and they have not been successful in doing this and you know it it's difficult for a lot of us. I mean, I get calls all the time from tenants saying like, You've got, there's, there has to be something you could do for me. I mean, I can't operate my business. Can't the courts lend a hand at all? And unfortunately for them, you know, the answer is no, because these contracts, which they signed before this pandemic, don't excuse them from their obligation. Now, Karima, the Bay is a huge business, and they still struggled with their obligations. So how has the pandemic impacted smaller commercial businesses and their ability to meet their lease obligations? As you can imagine, um, I, I think smaller businesses have been even more drastically impacted um, mm -hmm. because they don't necessarily have a large reserve of funds to, to draw from. Um, in, in many cases, it's... Uh, operating on a month-to-month -month basis and, and hoping to stay afloat in that way. Um, so the, the pandemic really um, put a damper in those efforts. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I, I see many small businesses in my neighborhood um, and when I leave my neighborhood that have closed. Karima, just briefly, I know that the government has created some relief programs for commercial tenants during the pandemic. Um, what can you tell me about that commercial lease program and how it's working? Um, it, uh, the, yeah, the government has in implemented a few relief measures. Um, there was a moratorium on evictions um, that ran um, throughout 2020. Um, and there was the emergency commercial rent uh, assistance program, um, which put the onus on landlords to apply and landlords essentially were given this forgivable loan. So if a tenant had a landlord um, who wasn't really interested in that process, um, they weren't able to access that relief 
Um, so I think that's been one of the main criticisms, but for individuals and parties who were able to, to access that, it, uh, in all, it was probably a lifesaver. Dan, briefly, your thoughts on that program, the Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. Yeah, I mean, what, what Karima just said was, was spot on, and it happened all the time that we, we had clients who were calling us saying our landlord's not opting in. I mean, the principle was uh, the landlord had to take a 25% haircut on its rent, the government kicked in 50, and a tenant would pay the additional 25. Everyone would share in the pain. But if landlords didn't opt in, tenants were, were facing problems, and then a new program assisted it, and it came with its own problems there. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing landlord and tenancy law with lawyers Karima Saad and Daniel Waldman. Now, I want to turn to some interesting stories in residential tenancies, and there have been a bunch of them in the news lately. Uh, for example, Karima, there was a situation reported by CBC in London where a student at Western University had signed a lease, and the lease included some shared space in the landlord's home. When the tenant arrived, the landlord saw that she had some tattoos and told her, I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to rent to you because your tattoos are too scary. So what would you advise either the landlord or the tenant in a situation like that? Well, I mean, the first thing is where there is a signed lease, um, you know, it, it's not really permissible to renege based on something as arbitrary as tattoos. Um, what wasn't entirely clear um, from the story was whether the shared space meant that there was an exemption from the Residential Tenancies Act, because where a landlord and tenant are sharing a kitchen and washroom, a different set of rules apply and recourse would be through small claims court as opposed to the landlord tenant board. Um, if in fact it, it is a proper residential tenancy situation, then the landlord's options for eviction are quite limited. And I can't really imagine a scenario where tattoos would justify. Um, so, you know, short answer, if I'm the tenant, um, I'm going to be looking at what are my, my options for recourse, either to force this tenancy, or if I don't really want to live with this landlord, to at least be compensated out of pocket expenses. Um, and as a landlord, um, you know, I, I probably will in the future want to do better diligence um, to make sure I'm comfortable with the tenant I'm selecting. Now, Dan, what, what's your view on this? What can a tenant do if if their landlord is is treating them unfairly or even discriminating against them. Certainly, um, tattoos is not the only reason someone might act in a discriminatory way. And, and does this type of thing happen in commercial contexts as well as residential ones? Yeah, it, it does. And I mean, it, it's timely because this came up last year uh, in a decision I wrote about called Elias Restaurant in Keogh Shepherd Plaza. And in that case, the tenant operated a commercial, uh, sorry, a Caribbean restaurant in a strip mall, and the landlord would not let them renew their lease, and they were ducking and dodging them. So the tenant applied for a leave from the court, and in response, the landlord said, "No, we don't want them to renew their lease because we don't want them here anymore because they're an unsavory business with uh, like unsavory customers and clientele." And what the tenant argued was. The landlord, whether it knew it or not, was displaying an attitude of anti-Black racism and were discriminating against them for that reason. And in deciding it, Justice Morgan agreed. And he didn't have to even look at that when making the decision because they were allowed to renew their lease. But he saw it in the evidence and saw it that way, saying, you know, you can't just do that. You can't say you, you don't like the way people are and look and behave and refuse to renew a valid lease with them for that reason. So th this case was seen as a very interesting development in a lot of ways because the court did not sidestep the issue at all. They kind of faced it head on and agreed with it. So it shows that tenants in the commercial space too will have some recourse from the courts if, uh, if, if they do feel and they could show to a degree that they are being discriminated against in that manner. Yeah, I, I read that case as well. It was a really interesting one because I think it, the court actually could have decided it on completely different issues because of certain mm -hmm. conduct of the of the landlord. Um, but they did address this racism issue head on, which I found interesting. 
Um, mm -hmm. in, in the time we have left, Karima, I want to talk to you about a trend we're seeing with rental frauds, especially in the residential context. What can you tell me about some of these scam fake listings, duplicate listings, and what you're seeing on the commercial or on the residential side? I will say that scammers have adapted and capitalized on the pandemic, um, in particular, um, the fact that there's not as much face-to-face -face interaction. And so behavior that would otherwise be a red flag, like let's just do this all virtually, um, you know, is, is accepted as being normal. Um, so, you know, everything ranging from people who aren't actually the landlord um, accepting money for rent, um, signing leases, I, I would say that that's the most major um, iteration of the scam. Um, and I've also had situations where tenants are sending money to someone who they think is a lawyer, but it's not a real lawyer's address and being duped out of their funds. Um, so it, it is, you know, it's a troubling context for sure. It's, it's certainly a lot easier to scam people these days in, in every context during this virtual world we have. We have to go to commercial, but we will be right back. Now, in the last segment, we were talking about fraudulent listings. And Dan, fraud isn't in, in real estate isn't limited to residential uh, situations. Commercial landlords can be defrauded as well. If that happens, wh what are you seeing in your practice and how does it get re resolved if a commercial landlord has been defrauded and, and how does it happen? Well, I mean, what I see most of the time, it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of what you call fraud, but commercial tenants, more often than not, what you see is is playing a, a shell game when it comes time to renting space. So they'll incorporate, say, a single purpose shell corporation to uh, put their name on a commercial lease, which is fine, regular, powerful, of course, but these corporations, because they're shells, they don't have assets. So if they default on their lease, they owe arrears, they owe rent till the end of the month, the landlord doesn't have much recourse when, when they come against them. And uh, in COVID, this type of thing erupted. Like big landlord clients, like commercial owners of commercial shopping malls and whatnot, were seeing their malls emptying out. And they were trying to recoup some of this rent that they were losing, and they were not able to do that. So a lot of the time, I mean, the best way to do it is have the tenant uh, put forth a letter of credit with the rental application or have the principal sign a personal guarantee to put some skin in the game. But like even some sophisticated landlords are kind of very eager to get these deals done and get their places tenanted. And they don't often think that far ahead because they don't think that there's going to be a rent default or whatnot. But when it is... They're usually, when it comes down to stuff like that, it's left with you know, little to no recourse. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because I think it's it's a time when a lot of people, everyone is really struggling these days. So the idea mm -hmm. of, of misrepresenting yourself to someone and taking advantage of someone, especially during this difficult time, is, is so hard. Karima, mm -hmm. I want to turn to you about a different situation in Nova Scotia where it was discovered that a Facebook group of landlords had created a, uh, a do not rent list of tenants. And this was really upsetting for tenants since there's a shortage of affordable homes in that province and there's a lot of competition for properties. Uh, so what are the legal implications and including privacy implications of, of these lists? And just to play devil's advocate, if a tenant really is terrible, why shouldn't the landlord warn other people about them? I would start by saying that where a landlord collects information, um, that's going to be subject to privacy law. And so the way that they share or disseminate info um, really needs to be in strict compliance with that. And the issue with a do not rent list, um, there's not any due process associated with that. And there's a risk of landlords putting someone on the list for reasons that are at worst petty um, and, you know, or potentially malicious even. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has serious consequences, obviously. Um, having said that, in, in Ontario, landlord-tenant decisions are anonymized. And so there is no real way 
Um, first of all, to guarantee that a decision will be posted publicly, and even if it is, that the parties can be identified. Um, so it does create a bit of a conundrum, um, which is why sort of references and, and vetting that, that process for landlords um, is, is so an important stage of the, the rental application. And in that case, was the list taken down? Did the tenants have any recourse? We've got about 30 seconds. I think that one of the lists was removed or made private and the other is um, still operational. Um, so as far as tenants having recourse, um, they might speak to the administrators of the Facebook group, um, but it, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, certainly. Well, I want to thank you both so much for coming on today. This is a topic that affects millions of Canadians. Everyone has rented at some point in their life or, or knows someone who has. So I want to thank you both for sharing your expert expertise. Thank Thanks you for, for having, having us. us. We've heard today about a variety of situations that landlords and tenants can find themselves in. From discrimination to COVID-related rent shortfalls, government programs, and even fraud. Landlord and tenancy issues are something that has a direct impact on the lives of millions of Canadians. Even if you don't rent now, chances are you did at some point in your life. And if you have children, they likely will rent as well, especially with housing becoming increasingly unaffordable in Canada. It's crucial for both landlords and tenants to have a solid understanding of the laws that govern their relationships and to seek out expert help from a lawyer if you find yourself in a dispute. That's all for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, a freer Canada starts with you.